So I just went to see Ready Player One, and I wanted to talk a bit about that. This is, is going to be a very different video from what I usually do, but that is sort of the point of the whole beta thing, that I'm allowed to do whatever the hell I want. So I'm going to talk about what I liked and didn't like. I'm not going to get into spoiler territory just yet, but I will get there and I will give a warning before I do so. So the book was written back in 2011 by Ernest Cline, and it's a book about Wade Watts in 2045, the dystopian future where everyone is sort of escaping into VR to get away from the sad reality of the world. Did I think that the movie did a good job of portraying what was happening and what was going on in the book? Eh. I mean, as with most movies, there are a lot of changes from the book to the movie, and I was expecting this. I didn't go to see a one-to-one -one translation. I never do. It's directed by Steven Spielberg, and for the most part, he's doing a, a good enough job. There's nothing that stands out as being bad, necessarily, but there's also nothing that really jumps out at being a moment that will stick with you. There, there was nothing in the movie that gave me chills, which I found a bit sad. Because it's a movie where you can really go nuts with the visuals, and for the most part the visuals were good. But the sound design in general was, I feel, a little bit lacking. When it comes to music, there wasn't a lot of it. There were a couple, like, harkening back to the 80s kind of famous songs from the era, but in general the, the overall tone of the movie soundtrack was just Hollywood. Generic orchestral swells and dips and dives to go with what was happening in the action at the moment. It was nothing that sticks with you, and it was nothing that stood out. To me, the most outstanding moment when it comes to sound and music was in the trailer, where they used a clip of Aha! Take On Me, and they were doing a sort of orchestral version of it. I was hoping that that would be a full-on score for the movie, but sadly, no such score were, was to be found. It was just... Normal Hollywood. But the visuals were pleasant enough to look at, and when it comes to positive changes from the book to the movie, definitely being in a visual world helps a lot when it comes to references and little easter eggs. Uh, and nods to the source materials and the, the references to the 80s pop culture, because you don't have to describe every little thing in detail, you can just show it on screen or have it in the background. And for the people who recognize these things, it stands out. When it comes to the acting, the most of the performances were alright. I do think that my main issue was with the lead character. Ty Sheridan plays Percival slash Wade Watts, and a lot of his dialogue felt very weird. It felt very forced. He, was, he, he had a lot of motivational and inspirational and dramatic speeches going on to his character, but it didn't feel like the actor really knew how to portray that or how to get the emotion across. I didn't feel anything for any of the characters. I didn't care about any of them. But I'm gonna get into spoiler territory now, so if you do want to watch the movie and or haven't read the book, then you might want to steer clear of this bit. 3, 2, 1, go. So they need to find three keys, right? And there's a challenge per key? But the first challenge was changed so much. In the book, the first challenge for the first key is sort of a roguelike dungeon where you have to get by booby traps and get to the end, and then you have to play Joust versus a Lich King, a, a, a skeleton in a throne room. And in the movie version, the first challenge is a race, a literal car race through town, through New York to get to Central Park. And on the one hand, yeah, sure, I get it, I get it. You know, it's a more visual thing, it's more of a spectacle, it's something that throws you into the world and shows off all of these crazy references and all of the wonderful wacky things you can do with a virtual world. There's buildings moving and there's King Kong is jumping around smashing cars, there's a T-Rex from presumably Jurassic Park chomping down on some cars and there's a lot that can be done with a sequence like that. But I still feel like it was an unnecessary change. I mean you can still do, if you do a dungeon quest right, you can still do it in a very thrilling and exciting and visual fashion. Especially 
when you're doing a movie that's harkening back to the 80s. Imagine doing the whole intro quest, the whole first quest in the dungeon, as if it was the intro sequence of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Homaging the whole thing in the temple with the booby traps and the... Maybe he could even use a, a whip. Maybe there could be a whip hanging on a thing or lying on the floor that he needed to use to get over a pitfall. Stuff like that. And then the visuals could have gone into creating the skeleton at the end, the skeleton king, the lich. So I feel like that was a weird change. I didn't, I didn't feel it was necessary. And I, I just don't like it when they change things in movies from books that don't feel necessary. It didn't save time. It, if anything, costs more to do it like they did. And did it turn out better than a dungeon would have? I don't think so. But it was visually fine, and there's a lot of cool stuff you can probably pick out on a second viewing if you watch it multiple times. There is one thing I really found weird, though, about how they portrayed the VR experience. Because when they had the VR headset on, and they were running around in VR, sometimes they were sitting and sometimes they were standing. It didn't feel consistent. Uh, but what was really weird to me, especially during the uh, end sequence of the movie, which is the biggest change from the book, is that they are driving around in a van, and as the van swerves and sways in real life, Wade's character in the virtual world is getting virtually tossed around and it's supposed to sort of build drama and make the end sequence sort of feel pressed for time. And, oh, will he do it even though he's being tossed and turned around? But that's his real life body, not his virtual body. Because in the book, he uses just gloves and a headset. He doesn't have a suit. He doesn't have full body tracking. And that's how he starts out the whole movie as well. There, there's no need for the full body tracking. So if it's a detriment to your success, then why would you keep it on? And another weird thing of how they portrayed VR is for the fight sequences they had people in VR headsets running down the streets and then cutting to the VR battlefield and they were running into battle. Or they had people jumping over wrecked cars to cover in VR, turning to the real world showing a lady jumping over a couch in her living room and taking cover behind that. So sure, for those clips it worked out well, but what if you jump over something that isn't there and you don't have a physical object to touch and also why are you moving around in the physical world? What if you're running into battlefield and then there's, in the real world, a light post? You'd just run straight into it. That was so stupid! In the book, everyone's at home. That's the whole point. The story is that no one goes out. No one sees anyone else in the real world. Everyone's cooped up in their houses because they're in the VR world. But in the movie, everyone was just out on the streets, but wearing a VR headset and running around anyway. Super weird! Oh, and also, side note, I could have sworn, I could have sworn that there's a point in the movie where the main bad guy, the antagonist, Sorrento, is talking to the girl, Artemis, slash Samantha, and he addresses her as Miss Cook, which is the real last name of the actress playing Artemis. But I could have sworn that I heard someone call her Miss Cook in the movie. And I don't know if that's... Maybe Samantha's last name is also Cook, but it was... it's weird. <laughs> oh, and also, there, there's, there's several moments in the movie when they cross out games off of a, a digital whiteboard, right? They have a screen, a TV screen, a touch screen, with names of games, and they cross it out with like a stylus pen, but it's making the squeaky whiteboard noise. Like when they cross it out, it's going like... Ee, ee, ee. So either someone in the editing room didn't know what a virtual screen was, or that software, the TV, the, the thing they were using, actually has a noise that plays when you cross stuff out to simulate the sound of a whiteboard. And in either case, it's ridiculous. Why even put that noise in? I couldn't help from giggling to myself in the theater. And when it came to, well, feelings in general, everything sort of felt really dumbed down. Because in the book, the evil evil company, the evil guys, they figure out where everyone is in real life. And then they go to one of these people and they kill that actual real life person. Meaning his character in the game goes away. But in the movie that never happens. They blow up the stacks with a bunch of randos, but none of the characters that we know are ever in any sort of danger. Then there's also this Irock character, which in the book is sort of half friends with the protagonists and he's in with the cool kids. And he sort of turns around, backstabs them a little bit and leaks information to IOI and the, the mean guys. But in the movie, he's just always with them. He's just a mercenary who's doing bad things for money. 
So again, all of that emotional response to him turning around and being mean to the good guys is just thrown out the window. And the biggest thing that was missing from the movie was the whole infiltration thing, because in the book, Wade Watts is infiltrating the Sixer company, Sorrento's company, IOI, by falsifying his identity and going undercover as just some guy who owes a lot of money. And by those means, he gets access to a lot of company uh, data and information, and he sort of leaks that, which sparks a revolution. While in the movie, they just fall back on the good old trope of bad guy spilling his beans whilst unknowingly being recorded. And then that's what they publish. It's like, th how many times are you gonna use that thing? The bad guy sort of just tells his whole plan for no reason, because he wants to look cocky, and then they record it, and oh, no, his plans are foiled. That was dumb. Just saying. And the whole finale sort of kept up the theme of falling emotionally flat because Wade Watts, the main guy, our Percival, had already met Artemis in real life, Samantha, a long time ago when the finale sort of rolls around. In the book, that's when they meet each other for the first time. They've spent all this time in the work virtual world, but when the finale hits and it's all said and done, they finally get together in real life. While in the movie, one of her cronies literally kidnaps Wade and brings him to this warehouse with a bunch of tents and she's like the leader, hacker, whatever, something. And it's very weird. And H, who is Wade's best friend and presumed throughout the movie to be a dude, just randomly shows up and is not a dude. In the book, that felt like a moment of insecurities coming through and friends reassuring one another and this whole thing of you never know who's who online. But in the movie, they sort of just go, oh, oh, I thought, no, I thought, oh, you're, okay, let's go now. And Daito and Shoto are just also there now in the van with H. So that means these five random people who are just playing the game for years and years and are all in the leaderboard all just happen to be in Chicago, even though two of them are Japanese. And a thing that I really liked about the book a lot is that at the end, for the whole grand finale, Ogden Morrow, who is the partner of the creator Halliday, he calls them up and says, oh yeah, I've been watching you all this time because I'm cool like that. And he sort of takes them in and he just kits them out. So they're sort of on equal grounds with the company. And then Parzival wins, of course, and he's faced with Halliday's avatar, the creator of the world. And he's given these god powers. He's given immortality and full access to anything. And there's this really cool emotional moment where the first time he uses his powers, he resurrects all of his friends who all died in battle for this victory. And he restores all of their items so they can play again. But the finale of the movie never had that. They just sort of drove around in this van and then everyone did die, like they do in the book, but he never resurrected anyone. He never used any of his abilities for good. The only good thing he did with his power, as told by, like, voiceover dialogue at the end of the movie, was to shut down Oasis on Tuesdays and Thursdays or something like that. But all your friends are still dead. So, okay. So all in all, ah, eh, the movie wasn't all that exciting. It's cool visually some for some parts of it, but I feel like they could have done so much more. Since it's a movie that's fully 3D, it's fully CGI for all of the Oasis parts, they could have done so much more. They had literally infinite possibilities. Crane or drone shots that don't need a crane or drone, impossibly tiny shots through tiny things. They could have done literally anything with the camera. But they didn't. It was all a digital movie, but it was shot as if it wasn't, which was a little bit disappointing to me. And all I can think of when I see a movie like this, and I know a movie like Scott Pilgrim exists, is that I really wish that Edgar Wright had directed this movie, because it could have been so good. So all in all, the visuals, sure. The music, eh. The story, eh. The acting, eh. I give it a 5 out of 10. Anyway. I just needed to get some thoughts out, and I hope you enjoyed listening to this. It's sort of like a podcast almost, right? Uh, if you do go see it, let me know what you think. Have you read the book? Are you gonna read the book? I recommend the book. Until next time, uh, take care. Peace out.